or the tick box on the screen in front of you. On behalf of Business South, may I recognize and thank our event partners who have made this evening and our series of seminars going into 21, 2021 possible. Our event partners, Guildford Borough Council, Waverley Borough Council, and Surrey Heath Borough Council. Thank you to you all. May I also thank, in anticipation, our speakers, uh, Alan McCaskill, Jenny Powell, Matt Prescott, and Professor Richard Murphy. I will give a short introduction before each of the speakers. And if you'd like to know more about them, please visit our website, www.businesssouth.org forward slash events, where you can also find out more about the work of Business South and how you might like to get involved. There is no questionnaire or survey after this event today, but if you have any feedback, please email us via the website. Finally, from me, the next Business South events are the Regeneration South virtual conference on the 8th of December. And then on the 19th of January, our seminar series looks at the digital future of business, followed on the 16th of February with our third seminar examining next generation workers and leaders as we move from sustainability and digital to issues affecting our people. And so to our very first speaker. And I'm delighted to introduce Alan McCaskill from Floating Energy. Uh, Alan, I've had a great, great pleasure looking at your biography today because it's, it's helped me make, um, so, uh, make, make look at geography and learning more about the Scottish walkers, waters. Alan has 40 year experience in offshore energy, oil and gas and renewables. He conceived and developed the Beatrice Demonstrator Project, which is in the Moray Firth, just north and east of Inverness, pioneering the technology to develop large scale wind farms in deeper waters further from the shore. In 2008, he founded Sea Energy Renewables. It became a leading independent in the UK offshore wind sector, establishing a portfolio of 3.3 gigawatt and international JVs in Taiwan and China. Repsol purchased the company in June 2011. In 2013, Alan founded Pilot Offshore Renewables with Nicole Stephen to pursue the development of the King Cardin offshore wind farm. Now, King Cardin is 10 miles southeast of Aberdeen. This is a 50 megawatt floating pilot program. And I know we're gonna see some pictures in a minute. And when completed later this year, will be the world's largest grid connected floating wind farm consisting of five 9.5 megawatt festers and one two megawatt festers wind float structures. The first generation was achieved in September 2018 and the full development will be complete in early 2021. And an amazing stat here, when it, when it should power 55,000 Scottish households. In 2018, in conjunction with Nicole Stevenson, he founded Flotation Energy to progress offshore wind developments in the UK and internationally. I'm delighted to introduce Alan McCaskill of Flotation Energy. Alan. I uh, hope you can see me. Um, I'm going to switch on to uh, uh, my presentation if I can remember how to do that. Uh, yep, share screen. Um, so uh, you should see that coming up now. Is that now visible? No, sorry, Alan, it's not yet. There we are. There we are. We're there, Alan. Okay. All right. What I'm going to do today is talk about offshore wind and in particular I'm going to talk about the King Cardin project. Um, this is a real project, it's literally happening as we speak and it is and when it's completed uh, early next year it'll be the world's biggest floating wind farm. This is the technology of the future, it's just an, a development of the offshore wind business which has been going on now for nearly 20 years. Um, and now contributes about 10 gigawatts of power in the UK. By the end of this decade, we're looking at rising that up to 40 gigawatts. Um, and probably by 2050, we're going to get to 70 or so uh, in order to meet the net zero target. 
So what I'm going to show you now is really the story of King Cardin in pictures um, and let you understand what an offshore wind farm is. So, so what is it that we're actually doing? Well, we have a semi-submersible structure, which you can see the small one here. As you can see, it's got three buoyancy chambers uh, on top of which on one of them sits the large, the, the turbine. That's a two megawatt unit. Um, but the big ones that are just now moving around um, are actually 9.5 megawatt machines. These are st steel structures, they're triangles. Those triangles are about 70 meters down each of the uh, faces um, and it's got three mooring lines. We put the turbine in in the yard and the first turbine was installed uh, on one of these structures in Rotterdam about three weeks ago and it's due to leave Rotterdam tomorrow or Wednesday or Thursday to sail to site. Um, the tow and operation, everything happens in semi-submersible mode. The physical height of these machines is about 191 meters and the rotor diameter is about 164. So they're big beasts. Where is the King Carden project? Well, the King Carden project is located just to the south of Aberdeen. It's about 14 to 15 kilometers off the coast um, in about uh, between 60 and 80 meters of water. It connects to the main grid set uh, connection for the city just to the south of it. Um, we should be running this machine for 25 to 30 years. We put the first two megawatt machine in in 2018 and that has been running for two years. Um, over the summer there, we just completed this operation of actually taking the two megawatt unit back to harbour for inspection and repair, and it will return when the project is completed in the, in the uh, next summer um, and uh, continue to generate. Um, the uh, project completion is next year. So this just shows you, just to give you an idea of the physical scale of these machines, um, this is the small machine being assembled in 2018. Um, next to it are two large jackups. Those are two of the largest jackups in the world, the Galaxy class Maersk and one from uh, uh, Rowan. Um, our machine, when fully assembled, is bigger, even though it may not weigh as much. Um, just shows you how that's done and uh, what it looks like when it's completed. Next thing is while we're building these machines, what you see here is the kit that's actually going to go on the seabed. Um, and here you can see the, uh, the anchors, the, 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 the ch chains and the weights that are used to hold these systems down. We need three for the big machines. Um, and these anchors are pulled in, tensioned, and then they're left on the seabed until we bring the machine in when we pick them up, hook them up, and then pick up the cable. This is the cable lay that occurred in 2018, and we did it again for the second cable last summer. And you can see here the cable loaded up at the factory. It was running round and stored on the vessel. And there you can see the vessel. It looks like you can just about swim across. It's about 100 meters uh, from the coast. I think it's the closest I've seen a vessel of that capability. Um, it's obviously running on dynamic positioning and um, that cable was then pulled in. Um, these are the substructures that we're using. They were built in Spain at the Navante yard in Northern Spain. And what you can see here is the uh, initial assembly of each of two of the, um, the, the buoyancy chambers. Um, these buoyancy chambers are about 13 meters tall and about 12 or 13 meters in diameter. And obviously there's a third one that got to be added. And uh, these were taken in January last year when my colleagues and I visited it. This was uh, the situation that we had in Navantia about um, uh, two months ago. And you can see the heavy lift vessel sitting there, which we drove the machines on board. And um, you get the physical size of the machine that had to be transported from Navantia to Rotterdam, where the turbine was installed. So here you see the substructures um, and you can see the difference in size. 
um, from the big ones that we've got sticking out much bigger um, to the little one which we brought in um, in 2018. Um, and uh, that is the, uh, the, 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 the challenge of offshore wind, particularly floating offshore wind, is the physical size of these substructures. As I said, with our 10 megawatts, 9.5 megawatt machines, we're using machines which are 70 meters on each uh, face. Um, as we move towards the next size up, which is probably going to be about 15 megawatts, those machines will increase towards 100. And potentially as we reach the final, or maybe the bigger machines towards the end, end of the decade, um, we could be moving to 110 or 120 meters. Major pieces of engineering that have to be fabricated and assembled. And what you see here is uh, the, the challenges that we've got. Again, you see the project, the turbine. Um, the remaining activities we've got is that all the substructures are now just about ready. Um, and what we have is a challenge of moving them from uh, Nalantia in Spain to Rotterdam in um, uh, the Netherlands. And then once we've assembled the turbine on board, we then have to move it from the Netherlands to, to Kintarden. Um, the first V164 machine is due to leave, as I said, probably Wednesday or Thursday, and it should be due on site in the early part of December. It's about a six day tow, weather permitting. Um, but all the schedules are um, going to be very dependent on the weather, um, which is a result of COVID. Um, our project was delayed by four or five months, um, and we had to, uh, we're doing winter installation now, um, uh, rather than uh, summer installation as we would have prepared. So the question now is, what have we actually achieved by building this project? Well, we are building the world's largest grid connected floating wind farm. We've operated that two megawatt unit in the North Sea for two years and demonstrated that it can be done. We've done something which is a key part of the future. We've disconnected and removed it, taken it home for inspection. Um, that's a significant challenge. So you've got to take the cable, disconnect it, drop it into the sea, and then we'll get to the big answer when we bring the 3.5 megawatt machine in and we pick that cable up and um, hopefully it'll still work. Um, normally cables in electricity and water aren't good companions, but we will make that work. And uh, we'll connect the cable there. And then as we move forward, we'll complete the program next year. And I think that's my time up. Um, so that's what I was hoping to show. I hope you understand and you've got some feeling for what this technology is and um, an understanding of the impact that it will have. This will be the future. You know, fixed wind has been what we've been doing for the last uh, decade or so, 20, 15, 20 years. But the future and the opportunity is with floating. And um, floating uh, is about 80% of the world um, lot usable seabed for, for offshore wind is for floating, not for fixed. We're fortunate in the UK to have relatively shallow seas surrounding the, the country, so we've been able to access it. But one of the things we have in Scotland is a lack of that sort of shallow areas, and so that's why we've had to pioneer floating wind. But I'm confident that it will become cost-effective and challenging the uh, and will be a significant player in the next um, 20 years, 10 years maybe. So that's me. Alan, thank you very much. That was absolutely fantastic uh, going through that. Um, uh, and I love the pictures and uh, it, it uh, kind of brought it home to me exactly what's going on here. And in the once we get to the question and answer session, it'd be really get, good to get your insights in, into the Prime Minister talking about this being a, a world leading sector and be great to get your insights in terms of how, 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 we've, how we've actually got into that position. But a, a question for you from Rosemary, Alan. Um, you talked about sourcing from Spain and Rotterdam. How much capability has the UK got to manufacture these type of products? And do you think we either have the skills or are prepared to teach the skills 
or will we be left behind? Um, it depends on what you want. Everybody focuses on the big pieces of kit, but uh, we design these pieces of kit. We, we uh, operate them, we maintain them. Um, we sell many of the key services that are required in order to do it. We have the opportunity to build some of these things, but just remember the physical size of those machines. You need very, very large yards, and um, you also need deep waters. The minimum water depth for stability in these machines without additional buoyancy is 13 meters. And there are very few ports in the UK. I think there's one in Wales, two in Scotland, which have that sort of water depth where you can actually do things. So it's a question of what you want to do and what um, and, and um, how you uh, choose to do it. Alan, thank you very much for now. We look forward to you joining us again in the panel session. Okay. Um, uh, very happy if you want to turn off your video and your, and your sound at this yeah. stage. And I'm delighted to turn to our second speaker um, who's gonna provide uh, an, a uh, a review of clean growth from a local enterprise partnership perspective. Uh, Jenny Powell is the clean growth lead at Enterprise M3 Local Enterprise Partnership. She joined the Enterprise M3 LEP in October 2016, firstly working on the European Regional Development Fund programme before moving to a central role with a focus on clean growth and rural. Before this, she worked on a range of projects within the economic development team at Hampshire County Council. And prior to this, she worked for Southampton City Council, securing funding to deliver sports and leisure facilities across the city. I'm delighted to introduce Jenny Powell. Hi, thank you, Andy. I'm just going to try and share my screen. OK, I think that's now working. OK, so um, hello, everybody um, out there. Still getting used to, to presenting um, on these uh, on these screens. So as Andy said, my name is Jenny Pell. I'm the, the Clean Growth Lead at Enterprise in Three, um, Local Enterprise Partnership, or LEP. Um, for those that aren't aware, um, we're a public-private partnership um, who are tasked with driving economic growth and developing the conditions for um, economic growth. Um, I'm just going to put the map up quickly, just to very, very brief um, geography. So we cover the vast majority of Hampshire um, and then sort of the western part of, of Surrey. Um, so my role, as Andy kind of alluded to, is that we are looking to drive economic growth and the conditions, but we are really, really um, mindful and determined that that should be in a clean way, that we shouldn't just be driving the economic growth at any cost. So I just put that quote up there from our, our chair of the LEP, Dave Axum, about the importance of transforming to a low carbon economy. So where do we sit in a, a kind of strategic priority in a national context setting? So obviously we have the, the net zero 2050 targets, which filter down to our work, and also the climate emergencies to, uh, that have been announced by our local authority partners and some private sector partners. We're also now working in amongst the sort of government 10 point green industrial revolution plan that came out last week. That's really interesting to see how that cuts across our specialisms in this area and the work that we're doing. And at a local level that then filters down into, um, I've put down here our local industrial strategy. That's what we were developing sort of up until the COVID crisis um, struck um, and is now being, um, Kind of morphing into a revive and renew um, plan. So this is our our COVID response plan. Um, you know, there's some startling facts that have come out of the, the COVID crisis about a quarter of our workforce, for example, being furloughed or losing their jobs. The unemployment benefit claimants rise at rooms by 131 percent. But we are a resilient economy, and actually that's when we kind of go through through next. So this is all in the setting of, of what we're working within. So clean growth. These are just the main sort of points which is said for us that it is a strategic priority. It runs through all of our strategic documents from our strategic economic plan in 2018 through the local industrial strategy development and now in our revive and renew uh, COVID recovery plan. And the background to a lot of that is I'm going to touch on these a little bit more, but our energy strategy we developed 
the work we do, the energy hub and our links to government and the region. And I'm briefly going to touch on our low carbon environmental goods and services or LKEGS report um, that we carried out. So about 18 months ago, we launched an energy strategy, which outlined at that point the 80% reductions before the net zero. But actually, one of the key things with this was actually, and it's become clearer and clearer over time, we look forward that actually to achieve the, the sort of the 80% savings and now the net zero is that investment from the private sector as well wouldn't just be achieved through public sector grants. Um, as a result of that, we also work very closely with the Greater Southeast Energy Hub, which are base funded and have uh, their main aim is to sort of bring forward and speed up local energy projects. And one thing I've already wanted to touch on actually is really interesting following Alan's presentation and then Rosemary's question is that when I came into this role, we were looking at what we would sort of call the low carbon sector, but by this we don't um, mean what you'd necessarily, not all sort of traditional environmental low carbon businesses. This report was done by a company that do the same report from London and Manchester. And what we actually found sort of mirrored what Alan was just saying about wind turbines, for example. So we found we actually had a much bigger um, uh, sector than we thought and a real, real strength of this area. And one of those um, sort of subspecialism, subsector specialisms, sorry, was wind. But as Alan said, not, not the kind of the building of the big wind turbines, for example, but all those design things and you know the control systems, all of those bits, a real, real strength of the area, which actually lends itself to our wider um, economic profile of being a design-led innovative area. So we found that we had these sort of sector specialisms in alternative fuels, building technologies, wind, um, alternative fuel uh, vehicles. So what does all that mean? It's all great having these plans and you sort of think, oh, okay, that's really interesting. We have this sort of lot of activity going on. Well, we're sort of translating that now into our recovery plan and, and sort of looking to the future as how we all help to develop, to deliver net zero. I think we're probably all really, really conscious that um, not everybody can do everything and we need to think as a let where our role is and what we what we do and primarily as an economic development function what role we can do to best support the sort of national and, and regional and local agenda so i've put a few parts trying to work out how to kind of show this in an easy way but um, <laughs> hopefully i've succeeded but so we have some priorities around the energy around the energy system and the decarbonization of building and transport obviously a massive massive area that low carbon sector itself and how to best support that but then also not forgetting the natural capital element and the environment around climate change adaptation and mitigation. And so how do we, we do that? Well, we do, can do that through business engagement, through our growth hub, through advocacy and support about actually pulling together those local um, uh, businesses that we have to support some of the stuff that's coming out from government, um, whether that's around the wind turbine, as I was saying, or around electric vehicles, or public transport and kind of that move away, move to active travel, for example. We cover a lot of transport infrastructure within the LEP. So actually, um, again, how do we move to the, say, the EV and EV infrastructure and how do we best support that? And also a really interesting bit, and I think coming through, it's coming through more and more, but actually the skills element of all of this. So we can use our influence and our funding to, to do certain things, but actually, um, how do we, a big part of the LEPS work is around skills and that future, future skills and how do we firstly understand what the jobs of the future are to make this transition and then help our sort of local providers, etc, put in the right courses um, and the right training for people. Enterprise and innovation, which also then picks up on the uh, LKEGS report and I was saying and some of the innovate, innovative um, companies that we do have and supporting them. And then finally, through the funding and convening. So some of you may be aware we had quite a lot of local growth funding, which has come to an end. But actually, how do we um, kind of make all future funding that we may have and we may deliver be very much low carbon and clean growth focused? So picking up on that, I just picking up some of the key actions and interventions in our uh, revive and renew plan. So looking to introduce a make every funding decision a clean growth decision, something around the green book stuff that was said today, but actually looking at all the decisions we make through what are the carbon reductions, what are the environmental impacts of everything that we do. 
um, supporting the development, as I say, those low carbon innovations, et cetera, and looking at some of the vulnerable spectres. I didn't, I meant to mention earlier about aviation and aerospace, for example, the alternative fuel specialisms we have, how can we kind of help perhaps solve some of those issues? Prioritizing the, the decarbonization of, of transport and buildings um, through our energy strategy um, work, and then working with our growth hub expertise to, to kind of put clean growth at the heart of what they do as well. And we've also just launched recently a clean growth forum, um, which is a, a kind of bringing together of um, a range of, of people and specialism across clean growth to help us develop our policy and, and help us make kind of good decisions in the future. So just kind of closing up, our ambitions generally are to put clean growth at the heart of the recovery and renewal that we do, to work closely through our growth hub and all that kind of exposure to business engagement that they, they have, decarbonizing transport and buildings, increasing the clean growth priority and focus in all future projects and to work around, like I said, the natural capital and environment more. I think that obviously my contact details there, if anyone wants to get in touch with me after that, I'll be really pleased to speak to you. I will shop, stop sharing my screen. <laughs> Jenny, thank you very much for a, a great run through what's actually happening uh, um, in our region with regard to maybe just one question that comes to mind um, in, in terms of uh, the skills and the clean growth agenda. One thing, one thing that took me a bit by surprise in the government's announcements was this emphasis on changing people's individuals, households heating systems. Uh, from uh, gas for gas fire boilers to, uh, to 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 heat pumps, uh, did that? How, how did you react to that? It took me on the bit of a blind side, really, in terms of that. It's something we, when we've been looking at, we work quite closely with sort of the energy systems catapult and partners with at University of Surrey all over the place. And actually, um, when we could sort of see this was coming because obviously the decarbonisation of our homes will be something that we have to do. And when you look at the the statistics about the rapid change we need to make of people's homes and buildings. I, I can't remember the exact stack, but it's like retrofitting one every few seconds. So you actually have the retrofitting side of homes and then you have the new builds as well and actually, you know, influencing the planning system and, and the kind of building codes, etc. Um, and actually it struck us a few months ago thinking, blimey, if you've got to suddenly have all of this happening, who are the people that are actually gonna, gonna do this? Um, and so it was a, a welcome announcement, actually, because you think, right, it kind of gives a, a bit of um, uh, certainty and of our thinking. Um, but it is a massive challenge, actually, to get the right certification. And I think finding that with the Green Homes grant at the moment, that the supply chain and the skills and the people to install um, aren't necessarily there. So um, it's going to be one of the bigger, bigger challenges, I think. Yes, Jenny, I think so. Thank you for your session. I get it'd be great to pick up when you get to the, the panel session about how, you know, how we pay for all this, really, because another another stat I saw was that uh, around the heating it costs about 15,000 a household to to convert that. So the, the cost in terms of it. But for now, thank you very much. You could turn off your camera and your audio and we look forward to you joining us uh, in a moment as after I after our session for the next two speakers. Uh, and I'm delighted to now turn to Matt Prescott from Heathrow Airport, who's gonna talk about their plan for sustainable growth. Uh, Matt is head of carbon policy and innovation at Heathrow. Matt leads Heathrow's approach to net zero and it's supporting research and innovation. Previously, he led its sustainable innovation portfolio through the Heathrow Center of Excellence. Matt's early career was focused on the built environment and sustainability. He also directed a climate change policy programme at a lead, leading UK think tank. For the past decade, Matt has led the development of sustainability strategies in sectors as diverse as healthcare, education, transport, food and infrastructure. Matt is a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, a fellow of uh, IEMA, uh, which is transforming the world, world sustainably, and a trustee of Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust. Heathrow and Matt are good friends of Business South, and I'm delighted to hand over to Matt to talk about their plan for sustainable growth. Matt. Thanks, Andy. Um, and while I share screen, I'll, I'll just apologise for any background noise as my um, air source heat pump is, uh, is going full. 
gone just at the moment. Um, right, so um, thanks ever so much for um, inviting me to, to join you this afternoon. Um, there's, uh, there's an awful lot happening just at the moment, um, on, uh, particularly around the carbon agenda in, in aviation and at airports in particular. Um, so I'm going to focus on um, just some of the uh, sort of recent highlights and, um, and pick out some of the key issues um, relevant for the South region. Um, just on screen now, all by the way, everything that I share here is public domain. So if you're interested in um, exploring further any of the documents or, or uh, issues I pick up, it's all, it's all public domain material. Um, so on, on screen now is um, uh, uh, the cover, on the left hand side, the cover of uh, a document published last week called the Heathrow Local Recovery Plan. This is a stakeholder partnership um, uh, looking at uh, post COVID um, recovery um, chaired by Lord Blunkett. Um, and the plan was published just last week, uh, 19th of November. Um, it covers, um, touches on the region, so it's so it, covers Surrey and Surrey Heath uh, in particular, but the um, some of the content has much wider ramifications to uh, regionally and, and nationally and beyond actually. Um, so it covers the skills, um, employment and education agenda. Um, it looks at supply chain, um, the green recovery, and also surface access, as we call it, or surface transport. Um, on the latter, um, quite interested to see that the stakeholder group have all ag agreed on the on the notion of, of avoiding a car led recovery, which I thought was quite interesting and encouraging to see um, and quite challenging for the region as well, um, but a good one. Um, and there's some other familiar um, infrastructure projects such as Western Rail in that uh, section. Um, but I wanted to just excuse me, focus on the on the green recovery um, issue for, for a few moments. Um, so the local recovery plan identifies the, the important role the Centre of Excellence can continue to play, um, but it also looks at um, green skills and, uh, and green jobs. Um, so I thought it'd be worth spending a moment just to unpack what some of those might look like as we move through, um, through the decade. Um, the, um, the, the first issue that we've been focused on a great deal over the past couple of years now is that of uh, sustainable aviation fuels. Um, and indeed, um, this uh, quite recent publication from the group Sustainable Aviation, which sets out a roadmap for, for sustainable aviation fuels in the UK, does identify, as you can see, um, seven clusters um, that it feels is suitable for, or the analysis shows is suitable for the production of sustainable aviation fuel, including um, in, in Hampshire. Um, so that's quite exciting. And you're talking about a range of different types of technology there um, around recycled carbon fuels. Um, and even as we move into the future, electro fuels or or, or what are known as fully synthetic aviation fuels, which have the potential to cut the life cycle carbon emissions um, almost, uh, if not to zero, depending on, on exactly the technology um, that is used. So that's a particularly exciting agenda. And actually in the Prime Minister's 10 point plan um, last week, it was called out, or certainly the jet zero um, uh, movement, if you like, was called out. Um, and the government pledged a further £15 million um, uh, as part of a competition to support SAF production in the UK. Um, and even has talked about the potential for um, putting a mandate in place to require uplift of sustainable aviation fuel by 2025. So that's one really interesting area of development. Um, very exciting. But of course, there are other technologies that will be central to decarbonizing aviation. Um, and there's been a lot of uh, talk about hydrogen recently. Um, and also, um, there is uh, the potential for electric and hybrid electric aircraft. And, 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 and um, we have a project just launched uh, at the beginning of this month, um, an Innovate UK 
funded project in partnership with a number of organizations which includes the University of Southampton um, and Rolls-Royce and others which is looking at how we prepare the airport infrastructure to support these novel aircraft um, uh, and, and their requirements. Um, you can imagine how complex and interesting the, the challenges around um, charging or battery swapping um, and uh, some of the uh, challenges to ensure that the hydrogen, particularly if we're looking at liquid hydrogen in some cases, um, can be handled safely and so forth. So there's a lot of work going on in that arena, which is um, also um, really encouraging. Um, and uh, we there's also the issue, and actually I've got a slide just to um, show, uh, uh, this is, um, I think it was September, the, these, these concepts, and they are just concepts um, at this stage, um, were publicised by Airbus. Um, and these are all hydrogen aircraft. And as you can see, from uh, some of the statistics on the slide, um, we're not just talking, of course we will be to begin with, but we're not just talking about small uh, aircraft perhaps in the business jet arena, we will be talking about passenger aircraft. And Airbus think that they'll be in production in the early 2030s for, for aircraft um, along these lines. So you certainly would expect to see something like that turbo fan at the bottom do, do, doing um, European routes, uh, that kind of aircraft, we'd be talking about 100 um, plus passengers. Um, and then there's another important um, uh, agenda as well that, that is the net in the net zero. Um, and some of the analysis that Sustainable Aviation published at the beginning of the year, um, back in February, um, shows that um, there's a, 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 a very good pathway to decarbonisation for UK aviation, but it does still rely on a contribution from market-based um, uh, instruments. Um, so one of the things that we've been doing as well is working cross-sector um, with a number of partners um, on a, a negative emissions coalition, which is essentially calling for um, the right uh, frank policy framework to support the development of a uh, ultimately a single carbon price in carbon removals. Um, and as you can see, it's not just the high technology um, direct air capture and other others that will have a role to play. You can see the National Farmers Union reference there as well, because of course there are all sorts of land use based um, sequestration opportunities that could align very well with developments um, coming through as a consequence of the agriculture bill, for instance. Um, and on, on the, the main caption there is, um, is, 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 is showing DRAX and that's relevant because they are um, producing um, uh, negative, well, they, they have now the potential to produce negative emissions through bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, which is um, relevant as well to the, to the Northeast economy, um, both in terms of the development of hydrogen, um, but also um, in relation to um, using uh, dis disused oil and gas fields under the North Sea. So that's an interesting area and um, uh, conscious of time, I would just um, conclude by saying that there's also um, uh, clearly a range of uh, products and services that need to be developed uh, and deployed at the airport to to deal with our with us what are known as scope one emissions our own direct emissions um, and uh, as a for instance we've got a big focus in 2021 on um, automation of the of our carbon footprinting work so we can free up people's time from from collecting and managing data to uh, to managing delivery of uh, decarbonisation projects so that in that space um, utilization of um, of, of uh, artificial intelligence and other automation processes to improve our, our carbon footprinting, of course, including aircraft emissions as well within that, um, is an example of the kind of thing that we'll be looking to do next year. So there's a, I think, to illustrate a, a, quite a, a, a breadth of, um, of opportunities um, for, for the business community um, uh, across the net zero agenda in aviation uh, at present. And happy to go into more detail um, subsequently. Hi, uh, Matt, thanks. Um, can I just ask you one, one, one question, really? It was really interesting. You brought the slide up 
it's as if prompted at the end. You know, I'm sure many of us may have had a little tear in our eye that uh, the 747 um, it, it has been taken out of service. Can you just take, paint a little bit of a picture in terms of, from a, from a, a sustainability point of view, where does a 747 fit against the newer planes that you're talking about there? Uh, briefly, if you can, but you know, just we shouldn't be crying too much, should we? No, I mean it's it's a it's a, <laughs> it's a fabulous win for, uh, for for the carbon agenda. Um, aircraft usually have about a twenty five year life, um, which is actually one of the reasons why sustainable aviation fuel is so important because you can put that into the tank of any any aircraft uh, that takes kerosene today. Um, aircraft each year become about 1.5% more efficient. But what we're talking about, you know, so it's a good, so a modern aircraft is significantly, is a significant improvement to a 747. But to make that step change, um, you know, take off 20, 30, 40% of the emissions from, from the next generation of aircraft, then we are looking about, we're looking at different propulsion technologies. And that's where hydrogen in particular, but also electric will have a, a, a key role to play. Matt, thank you very much. Please uh, turn off your video, turn off your sound, no and I look forward to you rejoining the panel in a, in a few moments. Thanks, Andy. Um, delighted to introduce our final uh, speaker today, uh, Professor Richard Murphy from uh, the University of Surrey. A very brief introduction, which is director of the Centre for Environment and Sustainability uh, at Surrey Univ University of Surrey. He's Professor of Life Cycle Assessment and the University Theme Champion for Sustainability Research. Uh, his background is in plant and fungal biology research, which involved him working in the UK, New Zealand, the Netherlands, Colombia, Malaysia and India. Uh, you, sounds as though you've been a familiar visitor to Heathrow, Richard. Uh, <laughs> since 1992, he has used life cycle assessment to understand how to make materials, resources using land and energy more sustainable. Delighted to welcome Richard here today. Um, Richard Murphy. Thank you, Andy. I'll just bring up my slides. No, hopefully you can all see um, my slides now. Um, so, well, thank you very much for the invitation to join this, uh, this excellent uh, group discussion. Um, the title of my talk is Pressure Drop, um, Thoughts on a Green Economy. So if any of you are fans of Toots and the Maytals, you may remember this particular song, which was very famous uh, a, couple of, uh, a couple of decades ago. Um, the reason I've called it pressure drop actually is because we do need to reduce the pressure that we are putting onto the planet and on our environment, um, both locally and widely. And so these are my thoughts on how we might be able to do that within the framework of a green economy. Um, I've just, screen sharing is paused, why is that? Shouldn't be. Sorry, everyone. I seem to have a resume share. I seem to have a uh, slight problem. Are you seeing the next slide? Could I just ask? We are, Richard, but it's in your desktop it's mode. It's not full screen. Okay. <laughs> there, that's better. Is it? Okay. Yeah. That's come up for you. It hasn't come up for me, but um, I'm sure we can get around that. Uh, um, fine. Actually, that will be difficult. Uh, are you now back to the desktop or not? Yes. No, right. Let me just do that again. Needless to say, everybody, this worked perfectly in the um, rehearsal. So you're now on presenter. presenter view. Yeah. And so it's okay, is it? No. It would be better to have it in full view. Go to full screen. Let's try again. That should be full view of the opening slide. And if you move on one, I think that's... There we are. Oh, it's only a partial view again, Richard. Yes. 
Thanks. Um, can I just reverse? Oh, there we go. Yeah, that's perfect. Oh, you've done it. So um, I won't spend much time on this. Uh, the, one of the reasons is I'm very happy to make this set of slides available to um, anyone in the audience afterwards uh, by contacting, um, please contact Business South and they'll have a copy to share with you. This just says something about what uh, the centre that I look after at the University of Surrey does. In effect, we, we are multidisciplinary research and teaching outfit uh, in all aspects of environment sustainability. And uh, we are very good at, um, at systems analysis uh, for low carbon, uh, for energy and for social impact as well. Um, I I'm, the topic that we were given was, was about green growth, but um, actually I'll say one of the big pieces of work that goes on in CES is actually not just about green growth, there's really significant work on understanding the inherent value of growth and, and what do we expect or want from growth. And uh, Professor Tim Jackson, some of you may have heard of him, um, his, his quite famous book, Prosperity Without Growth, um, leads the ESRC Center for Understanding Sustainable Prosperity. There's a link to their website here, and I, I can assure you that there are some extremely interesting articles that are freely downloadable and things on things like zero carbon sooner, the post-growth challenge, and things like the um, Revisiting the Limits to Growth, a, a very famous publication from the 1970s. I, I want to touch on three areas that I think we really need to address to achieve pressure drop. And actually, without collusion, uh, several of our other speakers today have, have referred to these already. So I'll, I'll touch on energy, including transport, land use, in which I'll include carbon storage particularly, but also releases, and food, and the built environment, and they've all come up in the talks of our other speakers. So very briefly, energy, including transport, is in massive transition in the UK electricity supplies. Um, there are some very interesting thoughts about where we will end up with, with electricity supplies, uh, even to the point is maybe electricity will be supplied to our homes and our businesses in much the same way that the internet is in as much as you'll pay for connection, not necessarily for consumption within reasonable limits. Heat is still very challenging for domestic heat and also industrial heat because the bulk of it comes from natural gas in the UK and um, for cookers and, and obviously central heating systems, which Andy's already mentioned. Um, and switching that system over is challenging. There is a lot of interest in, in hydrogen and green gas, in other words, changing the gas composition that's in our national grid uh, for gas um, and introducing hydrogen and perhaps introducing higher proportions of biomethane into it. So new technologies are making real inroads here. And I guess my summary for this whole area of energy is it's a really exciting time for energy. Many of my colleagues at the University of Surrey are doing some very exciting work in solar PV. And I can tell you that in CES, a particular colleague, Jonathan Chenoweth, is installing um, heat pumps in his own house. He's done his own um, uh, re-insulation of, of a Victorian terrace house. Uh, it was actually in Bristol um, and things. So if you want some practical hands-on discussion and advice, um, we're very happy to uh, work on that with you. Um, second area is land use and land use change, including carbon food and land occupation, the way we use land, has real potential for, for positive carbon storage. Um, Matt mentioned uh, bioenergy with carbon sequestration and storage, carbon capture and storage, or BECS for short, and it's really one of the very few technology we've got that can supply carbon negative energy. BECS operates essentially by burning sustainable produced biomass and capturing the carbon emissions from that which acts as a, essentially a carbon pump out of the atmosphere while still supplying energy. And the final item here is really that food and diets as I'm sure we're all aware are changing and they will continue to change towards lower carbon probably because of more emphasis on plant-based diets and indeed more local production. Um, there will always be importation of food into the UK at our current population levels. So it, it's not, you know, that's not going to go, but I think we'll place much more reliance on 
local um, low carbon foods. So new technologies and new land management approaches are going to support environmental land use, which will be a positive play in carbon, but it will bring other benefits like biodiversity. And I would like to touch very briefly with this quite busy slide on our use of satellite earth observation. It's in, an, in the Surrey Hills. Um, we're working with the DEFRA project and with the AONB to look at observing and managing and optimizing habitat and habitat connectivity for a whole variety of species. This example is the silver wash fertility butterfly um, over towards Dorking. But you can see a huge amount now from, from space and you can monitor things independently and, and regularly and you can take environmental actions that can really enhance the quality of habitat and also things like carbon storage in soils and on land um, with great efficiency using these new approaches and technologies. I think they hold a lot of opportunity for the future. The way we can take these, these things forward is really through a whole variety of actions and engagements, I think. And uh, obviously you'd expect me to say something about the university and its role in this. And um, I called it a green economy for um, really for Surrey and for the UK and, and the university, whilst we, we value greatly our, our national and our international reputation, I think we really want to play a significant local role um, in, in, this, in, our, in Surrey and in the southeast more generally. Um, the university has pledged to be net zero by 2030 and we're going to be really open on that in partnerships, demonstrators and how we get there with collaborations. In my own centre, we have some excellent schemes for project engagement with business or government, including local government, obviously, NGOs and so on, with our practitioner doctorate programme, where students are embedded and work within organisations outside. Shorter MSc level projects. We have a Surrey Living Lab um, set up that can provide co-funding for interesting local projects, some of which will use the campus, some of which will use local community as its uh, platform. We have the Surrey Energy Partnership, and we're doing specific work in a number of initiatives. This example here, Crest 21, is, is with Woking News and Mail and with uh, the Woking Borough, uh, which is an environmental awards scheme running next year, the year of COP26 in the UK. We're members of the Surrey Climate Commission that was formed about 18 months ago as a, as a voluntary group. We strongly support the Surrey Wildlife Trust who have a very interesting natural capital investment program and we support also the Surrey Hills AONB who are having a symposium tomorrow on um, nature recovery networks and how to build those for biodiversity in our region. So without further ado I'd like to say thank you for your attention. There is a slide of various links to my talk here and as I said I will provide that slide um, as part of the set um, to um, Business South for distribution later. Thanks very much. Richard, th thank you very, very much. Before we, before we go into, I'm going to invite the, the host, the um, other speakers to join the room. One last quest question for you, really. You know, again, I think that the, the surprise that I see with some of this debate is some of the issues that individuals can trade. It was interesting you brought up about diets um, and and uh, the way that is affecting uh, the environment. Is there anything you'd like to add to that? Because that seems to be something that's in our control. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's one of the sort of classic things of um, uh, not just technology implementations, but kind of behavior change or adaptation. And um, you know, this often these things often have multiple benefits. They're not just about reducing carbon footprints, but they can bring with it health benefits. They can bring with it all sorts of, you know, excellent connectivity with your local uh, community and so on. So um, I'm, I very much support this as, as an agenda. And I think it undoubtedly has a substantial effect on our carbon footprints as well. So we have a, a super project at the moment with WWF also over in Woking actually looking at at this area too. They're, they're very keen on it, obviously, for their agenda in, in helping to um, sustain and improve biodiversity in a whole variety of landscapes. So yeah, we, we've got a lot to be thankful for where we live, and I think there's a lot more to be gained by 
by thinking a bit more carefully. And it's not just about food waste, it is actually about agricultural supply chains. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. Uh, can I ask the other speakers to rejoin me? It'd be great to see you again. Uh, if you'd like to take your take yourself off uh, audio and open up your visual, we can see you. I think we're there. Fantastic. We've got about five minutes left uh, in in terms of this. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you all a question in a minute, but I did want to come back to Alan really um, uh, because. Uh, the question is how wind has become a, um, a world leader in the UK. What's, out of very succinctly, what's the secret? What are we, every country's got, many countries have got sea around it. What, what have we done differently? What's your observation? Um, I guess the main thing we've got that we've done differently is that we had a system in place which allowed the companies to develop it. And, um, the technology has improved dramatically and we've also started to move further from shore where the wind speeds are best but the biggest advantage you have in particularly in the southern part of britain irish sea and the south uh the sent the southern north sea is you're very fortunate to have relatively shallow waters very fair distance out to sea doesn't get much deeper than 30 or 40 meters which has allowed fixed structures to to, to come forward where we're looking now is for much bigger machines in much deeper waters further from shore. And also spreading the, um, the energy generation around the country, which may actually stabilizes the use of a, um, a, a, an intermittent resource. Alan, thank you very much. Uh, quick fire round in the last few minutes then to, to everyone. Um, in the context of our topic, what's most exciting you about the future uh, in terms of clean growth? And what's your biggest fears? Uh, anyone like to jump in and uh, have a go first? Jenny, you're smiling at me there. Do you, do you want to pick up first? Just a nervous reaction. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what excites me most is actually we're seeing a, a whole change if that makes sense so from the finance system through to the you know aviation through to individuals it seems to seems to be on the cusp of a very big step change obviously that's bound around the Paris agreements and the government all of that sort of legislation etc but there seems to be a real a real buy-in and I you know particularly excited around you know the financing and, and changing the way we finance things to put a, you know the carbon tax etc that really excites me the thing that worries me is um, the more you understand the subject matter and the more you get into it and you, the size of the issue that, that people will so think this is too big, I can't do this, you know, I don't want to, you know, this is it's too much. So it's sort of one and the same thing. The biggest, greatest thing is also it's the biggest, my biggest fear about it. Thanks, Jenny. Anyone else like to jump in? Richard. Yeah, I think one of the most exciting things is, is we've known about a number of these technologies or these steps that can be taken is possible to take. And we're starting to see them actually happening now. And that's that's um, amazing, actually. I mean, I've been in this game for a long time and, and we've been sort of pushed back periodically by oil crises and things like that that have generally, um, or, or the opposite of oil crises, actually incredibly low prices have been one of the biggest constraints on developing green technologies. But um, that, I think, is one of the most exciting things that you can see these things coming into, you know, almost daily use, actually. And that's brilliant. One of the most challenging things I think that's going to happen is, is, is sort of organizing a transport for people so that we can retain lots of the freedoms we enjoy at the moment, the freedom to move around in our own local area, but also moving around nationally and internationally. And that's been, that's had a you know, we got very used to that. And I think it's hard to see us going back to a situation where there's going to be less, if you like, personal mobility. So we've got to deliver that in a, in a low impact way. And I think we've heard today, actually, from, you know, green electricity supplies, advances in aviation, all of those things. Actually, although it's going to be challenging, it, I think it's going to happen. So I'm, I'm an optimist in this one. Uh, thank you, Richard. Alan and uh, Matt, would you, what's, uh, 
What's exciting? What are your fears? Who'd like to go first? I'm happy to go. Um, I think for me, the, the 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 positive is the pace the pace with which uh, change is now occurring, which I think is broadly Richard's point. Um, but I think underlined by the fact that the 2050 um, goal for net zero is generally interpreted by most in the business world and indeed the public sector as something that needs to be delivered sooner. Um, so there's a so there's a good degree of of, of, of action, well certainly momentum building right now for delivery of some deep decarbonisation uh, earlier than we might have originally anticipated. So that's really positive. My fear, um, I mean there are many, but um, I, I pick up on an article I read I, I read in sometime in the last week um, about a study which showed that the, the level of anxiety about the health of the natural environment amongst younger people is growing massively. So there's some real um, you know, mental health challenges, frankly, around um, uh, concern about the state of nature. Um, and that's really troubling. Um, and there's no easy answer. Matt, thank you very much. Alan, um, anything you'd like to add? Um, Exciting and worries. Well, I mean, I think it's a matter of how, I, I just as, as Matt just said, um, it's, it's bringing together the engineering and nature for the, um, I've kind of spent quite, quite a time this year writing a paper on birds, which was something as an engineer I never really expected to do. But in the end, if we want to build these massive machines, we want to do it without harming birds and to do it in a way which allows the natural world to progress um, independent of what we do. And that is um, what I think can be done as we move into deeper waters further from shore and we start to deploy the floating technology, which if we can lead on that, we may not be selling substructures halfway around the world, but we will be selling all the skills to build them in each of these places, to assemble them and to design them, which is I think what the UK has switched to rather than bashing lots of steel. Thank you. And uh, thank you, everyone. Our time together is over. Um, our, our hour has flown by. And so finally, can I thank all of our speakers, Alan, Jenny, Matt and Richard, our event partners, Guildford, uh, Waverley and Surrey Heath Borough Council. And uh, may I thank the audience for, for joining us here today. Um, thank you, have a very pleasant evening and I look forward to seeing you at future Business South, Business South events uh, in January, 19th of January, where we're looking at the future of digital business. So with that, thank you and have a good evening. Thank you, bye-bye.